Hello everyone and welcome. Today I am talking with Dr. Monica. We are going to be discussing slavery in both the New World and also in the Ancient World. And I'll show you real fast her webpage if you're interested. So here she has her page and there's a whole about section. There's all kinds of different information. You can find a whole reading list for PhD students and even a section here on King Mansa Musa, who those of you who know about the Empire of Mali will know all about Mansa Musa. So uh, welcome, Monica. And this Hello. is also the first time I have to note that I've done an in-person interview rather than something online. Absolutely. It is good to be here. Um, always um, good to talk to people. Like I said, I have my own type of uh, podcast, so it's always fantastic to, to get some conversations from other people. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's all kinds of topics um, that, you know, I want to cover, but they're not necessarily within my wheelhouse, so I usually like to try to do a bit of outsourcing to find people who know the subject better than I do. I am here with the cape, my friend. I wear the cape. <laughs> All right, fair enough. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's talk about some of these comparisons of slavery in the ancient world and then, you know, slavery in the more modern world, as we call the United States, the modern world. Um, what are some of these comparisons? Well, I mean, I would say that, um, I mean, the basic fundamentals of what slavery is are the same. The ownership of one human being by another. Um, so, because I, I know some people have tried to make the case that there are some conceptual differences between slavery, depending on where you're at, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. I mean, slavery is fairly basic in that sense. It's quite literal ownership. Absolutely. Ownership of property. Now, where most people um, misunderstand is the contrast, right? Different versions of slavery happened over time right so you can talk about how slavery was in ancient in the ancient world yeah and even then it varies between the different ancient civilizations a bit so for instance um one of the major factors in ancient slavery and one of the differences between the greeks and the romans even is just mere scale so in the greek world most slave owners would only have a handful of slaves and the effect of that is that they're much more protective of their slaves. They're less likely to be um, exploitative in a way that would result in death or serious injury because it would be economically damaging to them. Whereas in Rome, a lot of the large-scale senators have these massive plantations, and they were often willing to overlook an immense amount of cruelty. And a lot of times, because of the number of slaves they owned, they weren't really looking after them in any meaningful sense. Um, so just scale alone actually is pretty significant in terms of uh, you know the quality of life for a slave or their experiences. Yeah, absolutely. And then here in the United States, you had race-based chattel slavery. Okay, that is the the big line in the sand. You had uh, intergenerational slavery. Okay, a woman's womb was property. Um, and then of course you had. Uh, sexual exploitation mm -hmm. also intertwined <clears throat> with slavery in the United States. Um, one one minute uh, black people are considered property and then clearly the next minute they are uh, sexually trafficked. So it's a very forked tongue situation with slavery in the United States as opposed to slavery in other places. So in the United States, you had a justification for it. You had a pretext for it. And uncomfortable as it may seem for some, most people already know that religion was used as justification for chattel slavery in the United States. But uncomfortable as it is for some to hear this for the first time, that wasn't the case everywhere. So you wanna talk about that justification or the lack thereof in, in, ancient, in the ancient world? Sure. So um, first, I'd like to uh, make the point about um, sort of like who gets enslaved in antiquity. So in antiquity, there is some discomfort with enslaving one's own people. That being said, it happens. Mm -hmm. So for instance, the Greeks, to the extent that they ex ex um, oppose slavery, even in, say, democratic Athens, 
it was mostly limited to the idea that they shouldn't be enslaving other Greeks. Right. So part of the part of Aristotle's analysis in his works on politics is that he says that Greeks by nature are free men and barbarians, that being any non Greeks, so people who sound like they say <clears throat> bar 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 when they talk ah. are natural born slaves. Right, right. It sounds like the doctrine of discovery a little bit with enslaving people who aren't Christians or so. It's kind of like that, mm. yeah. And also uh, the thing about ethnicity and antiquity is that once you learn how to speak Greek and you learn Greek culture, you're more or less Greek as long as you want to be. Mm. And uh, another part of that is, so that's part of why people say that ethnicity matters more for race in antiquity right. or than race. Uh, because the Greeks a lot of times are going to colonize places and keep in mind, these are the Greeks who invented philosophy and are supposed to be this peaceful, enlightened people. But the way that they did colonization is that it would be an all-male colony that goes out. And when they find a place they want to settle, they would then take wives by going to a local tribe, killing the men, capturing the women, bringing them back, and then cutting out the women's tongues so they wouldn't be able to teach their kids a non-Greek language. Mm. So, I mean, there's some built-in brutality uh, with the Greeks that I think a lot of people easily overlook. Absolutely. And um, But again, slavery could happen to anyone, but usually you're more likely to be freed if you're enslaved by people who are uh, your same ethnicity because then they'd be a little bit embarrassed by the fact that they own you. Mm -hmm. It's it's interesting. Um, people who read Anthony Browder are probably ready to jump through the screen if they hear you say that Greeks invented philosophy <laughs> because the research oh. of Anthony... No, that's okay. The research of Anthony Browder is deep you guys can do that uh independently but so you would say the justification for initially enslaving greeks was based upon individuals not being greek usually mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of the justification too is the idea of the prize of war mm -hmm. so like in the iliad for instance um whenever someone's captured in war there it's considered to be a spear one person or a spear one land mm -hmm. And I mean, the whole conflict in the Iliad Book One between Achilles and Agamemnon is over Agamemnon's right, I guess you could say, to hold the woman of uh, Chryses as his hostage because he took her in a battle, so therefore she's his property and his prize. Mm. Um, so there is partly this idea of people you capture in battle being your prize and therefore you have a kind of entitlement to own them. Um, so that's part of early Greek ethics mm -hmm. is that uh, this idea of uh, anybody who's captured in war is justly made a slave. Right. Um, so yeah. yeah, for sure. And in fact, that, that goes to the point of Africans at one point mm -hmm. enslaved other Africans, right? Most people know that story and they like to talk about that. But what the United States chose to do, and it was a choice, was to create an ideology behind enslavement and then turn it into chattel. Yeah. Right, so you had different versions of slavery, captives of war, prisoners of war, oftentimes in uh in, in the ancient world, antiquity people were um a part of the family, they weren't you know their children weren't slaves just because they were enslaved, so <clears throat> that version uh, of slavery and servitude um was a lot different than. Um, what people are familiar with, with race-based ethnicity slavery, with the justification behind it. And I think what people really may need to understand is how that justification was intertwined with society, right? And then religion also, right? Because if you read any of those primary documents by politicians at the time, it was definitely heavy with the curse of ham and, and stuff like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Ooh. From, from what I understand, though, in uh, that period where, you know, especially the South is trying to develop this ideology to justify slavery, I mean, wasn't this a fairly late emergence, like 1820s and 30s, in terms of the fully formed idea that slavery is actually a positive good? Right, right. That that would be your John T. Calhoun's, uh, your James, James Hammond, your Fitzhughes, um, those would be your, your politicians. Um, oftentimes I like to play the video, a cult of personality for my students so they can understand the power of, I think we're showing our age when we talk about that, 
in Living Color song, The Cult of Personality. Yeah. But I play it every semester for my students when I'm explaining the power that the Southern states had at, had at this time um, over Congress, over the presidency. Well, heck, they, they left because, you know, Lincoln was elected and they didn't vote for him, right? So um, it, it was a powerful trick. And I think most people know that they slave owners were the minority. However, they had the most power right that had the most influence okay and it wasn't until slavery was was over that 13th amendment where white people who were poor in the south were actually able to get employment opportunities right so slavery yeah. puts everyone out of business you know yeah. so slavery being eliminated was good for for poor white americans yeah. so they can have employment opportunities to support their family in a substantial way yeah yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure similar things, well, and especially in the Roman world, at least, slavery also was quite harmful for the poorer citizens and then free non-citizens, because what happens in Italy in the course of the late Republic is that land becomes more and more concentrated in fewer and fewer hands, and the wealthy senators and others who are accumulating land, what they're doing is creating vast plantations and filling them up with slaves or mostly captives from foreign wars. So in your small farmers, have their land lost and they end up more or less unemployed back in Rome. So they're either unemployed or underemployed. In the meantime, the countryside is full of people who obviously do not want to be slaves. And that's actually how Rome gets its three major slave revolts is because they look around and they realize there aren't that many free people holding them back. So they start repelling, um, <laughs> as, you know, as makes sense, especially yeah. since the gladiators were also slaves and they had weapons and skills. Yes. So, you know, why not try to revolt? And especially, that's, so the Romans had to start being careful about not importing a massive number of slaves from any given war or any given region at one time. So that was part of the problem with the first slave revolt in Sicily is that they brought over a bunch of slaves from Syria all at once. So they all could communicate, and one of them uh, knew about the Seleucid Empire's customs, so he claimed to be the next Seleucid king and um, started the revolt. So it, it, it became a real social problem, even for the free people of Rome, that slavery was not only taking away their land, but also creating massive disruptions in the countryside in general. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why don't you talk more about <clears throat> the ideology of enslaving other people in ancient times? Well, um, so it can be a bit complex because... Uh, I think there's a little bit of difference between the Greeks and the Romans in this regard. So for the Greeks, uh, they only really start to try to sort of wrap their heads around slavery starting around the 4th century, so the late classical period. And a lot of the conclusion they come to is that it's problematic to enslave other Greeks. And that's something they've been working on for a while. So usually one of the benefits of citizenship is that you can't be enslaved for debt. So that's something they have sort of evolved in the archaic period. Mm -hmm. uh, and then later on, the idea starts to shift to the notion that um, there are certain groups that are make good slaves, like the Thracians to their immediate mm -hmm. north they regard as barbarous. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it will get a little bit racial, actually, because they'll talk about how the Thracians tend to have red hair, therefore they're a little different, although it's also then that much more interesting and contradictory because uh, in the Iliad, King Menelaus is famously red-haired. Ah. And so it's not, they're not that different. Right, right, right. No. Um, so it, it starts to get, they don't really have a coherent reason to own slaves. Mm -hmm. It's more just something that is a practice that dates back well into the Bronze Age that they've just inherited. And they're trying to sort of fit that in. And that becomes a real problem in democracy, at least intellectually. But it's not as big of a problem as we might think for them, because in democratic Athens, where you have universal male participation, about half the population is enslaved. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So the, yeah. the leisure that citizens have is because they have slaves doing their work. Right, right. So and I, I think there's a case to be made that ironically like the idea of freedom only makes sense when you see people who have no freedom. Right, right. But you can only really articulate what it means when you've seen the exact opposite. Right. And and like you said, there there well, there's no justification for slavery. 
right? All these ideologies are makeshift, right? Because even people who are Bible scholars, and I, I am a woman who has read the entire Bible, it was on purpose, right? I yeah. purposely wanted to conquer that. And you're not supposed to enslave other Christians, right? Yeah. So that that's in the Bible. You guys can read that, all right? But understand that, so that right there is is a is a problem for um, individuals who converted to Christianity and were still enslaved, um, and for a short period of time, that there were Africans who um, converted to Christianity and were able to evade slavery via that loophole, but then clearly it went fell by the wayside, um, and you know, state by state, Maryland, Virginia, Massachusetts, they began to eradicate that law. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> why don't you explain to the listeners how slavery ended in Greece and Rome? Well, um, so in Greece, the Greeks lost their independence to the Romans. Yes. Um, so the Romans took over. And most Roman slavery was actually fueled by war. One big difference also between Roman and Greek slavery is that in Roman slavery, manumission was actually very common. So in Greek slavery, it happens, mm -hmm. but it's a little bit more exceptional. And usually it only happens to people who are high skilled and their, their skills are very valued. So mm -hmm. the city that they live in will reward them to keep them around. But in Rome, it was almost standard for people to be freed at a certain point. Um, and partly it's for reasons that are actually not very charitable. So Cato the Elder, who is a notorious, uh, I don't know how to describe him, let's just call him a notorious person. Okay. Um, <laughs> his, his advice to slave owners is that if your slave is old and sickly, then in order to avoid paying to keep them up, you should free them right before they die. So that way they can, you know, die on their own, on their own dime. Uh... But most of, there are people who are kinder than Cato, obviously, who actually freed slaves because they grew up with them and they respected them. Like Cicero had a secretary who was a slave named Tyro, and he very much, uh, they were good friends, and he made sure Tyro was taken care of. But um, it was standard that you would be freed at some point. So the point is, once you stop taking in as many POWs <coughs> because of manumission over time, slavery kind of dies out. Now, there were people still born into slavery but they're being born at a lower rate than people are being manumitted. Mm. So effectively what happens is that by the time we get to about the third or fourth century, now that Rome is no longer expanding, there just isn't a large slave population anymore. It's just kind of fizzled out. Interesting, interesting. Interesting on how it could fizzle out because there's no justification behind it, right? There's no, there's no pretense behind it. There's no ideology behind it. Um, and that, that's pretty much what happened in places like Africa and the like, right? Because of these um, contrasts in slavery. But in the United States, clearly we have a civil war over slavery, yeah. right? No matter how you slice it and dice it, states' rights, the yeah. right to do what, right? Well, Own slaves. I mean, isn't it the right to have a tariff on, <laughs> let's see, what good? I don't know. Uh, property? Yeah, or what? things... things grown by slaves maybe yeah 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 cotton cotton but, right right uh, there's actually i do always find it funny when there's because i feel like every few years there's a big article that'll get a push that actually the civil war was about this thing and i think one of the more recent ones was about the rise of wall street power. oh yes i I've, yeah. I've probably read that one yeah. but this is how i i like to say you know if the united states did not have slavery we would have never had a civil war right yeah. Never. It never would have occurred, okay? And what people fail to realize is even after the Civil War was over, you had individuals who were slave owners who relocated to Brazil in order to continue to try to push slave labor and grow cotton. Yeah, the Confederados. So, right, yeah. right, right. So, like I say, I, I really... People who do not want to believe that the Civil War wasn't about slavery they continue to work hard to do that and they have that right but the civil war was over black people being enslaved all right yeah or um another good example that i learned from uh, my buddy sean who you know is a civil war expert is that um around 1864 
um, the Confederates knew they were losing the war, so they were looking for ways to mm -hmm. revitalize their war effort. And one of their generals, Patrick Claiborne, made a proposal that they should offer freedom to slaves who were willing to serve in the army. That is correct. That happened. And uh, uh, the government ordered him to never repeat those words again. Absolutely. So he was, this was, he was kind of almost blackballed, and even though he's one of the more skilled commanders, he was never promoted again either. A hundred percent. And in fact, that was one of the reasons behind Lincoln's emancipation, right? To, to stop the southern states from using their slaves during this war, right? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, a variety of arguments go into it. But like I said, the bottom line, if you don't have slavery in the United States, we don't have a civil war. And, you know, a lot of literature... so talk about the mere fact that the the idea of men having access to all these women's bodies yeah is is another cause for the civil war another uncomfortable topic but you know there are a lot of powerful men who have access to a lot of enslaved women and their bodies and little girls and little boys mm -hmm. let's be you know we're all adults here yeah. That that people did not want to stop doing, and that was a cause, whether people want to admit it or not. It's a variable in this equation. Yeah, I mean, I mean, every slave owner in the South was effectively an aristocratic lord who was yes. unaccountable on his own lands. I mean, uh, they could abuse the people under them as much as they wanted with no repercussions because there were no legal means of redress. Uh, I guess the most famous example, but I would say probably a pretty mild one compared to what almost certainly happened on most plantations, is you know Jefferson's uh, relationship with uh, what's her name, Sally uh, Hemings. Hemings. Yeah. That is correct, absolutely. Um, yeah, and today we call that pedophilia. He was in his forties. He was yeah. a teenager, fourteen, fifteen. Like so yeah, uh, that's clearly um rape whether or not they consent or not yeah so yeah and there's a lot of literature on not just J thomas jefferson although he's the most obvious um and that goes back to that forked tongue i talked about right you you are part property but you you don't have sexual relationships with a desk or a chair that's you know so you need to figure out how you're going to except in four Yes, I mean, people, people, well, that was the overarching issue with uh, Margaret Garner. Uh, that's the book, uh, Toni Morrison, Beloved's, uh, based off of that book, where she's escaping her slave owner, the enslaver, across the Ohio River, um, and her children were by him, all right, very fair-skinned children, um, and she took it upon herself to, to cause harm to those children, um, to try to prevent the slave characters from taking her back into slavery. And um, she was successful in that act. And they, the, the, the prosecutors at the time didn't know whether or not to charge her for property damage or murder. Because if they charge her with murder, then you are admitting that this person is a human being. And you're setting that legal precedent. Mm, interesting. So very, like I said, I, you know, America is full of hypocrisy, but the world is full of hypocrisy. Yeah, and I guess uh, a lot of the American defenders of slavery were also able to draw upon uh, some of the writings of Aristotle and others, because, I mean, a lot of the Founding Fathers were actually very well-read in the classics. I mean, Aristotle actually defines a slave as an animate tool, and I believe that quote was uh, pretty widely circulated. Oh, 100%. And in fact, John C. Calhoun was um, a an expert. People would call him an expert in the classics, for sure. Um, and he would quote Socrates and Aristotle quite often. And of course, they would use the Bible. You know that. Servants yeah. and slavery in the Bible. That's why the entire slave Bible came about, where the book of Exodus was, was taken out. A significant part of Ephesians. So anything that spoke about freedom and equality was taken out of this slave Bible that was heavily circulated in the South. And um, everything about servitude and slavery was was um, used to justify the actions of the people in charge. You know, yeah. I mean, it's almost as if the people in charge are self-serving when it comes to how they uh, 
tend to frame things. You know, that that is true. And you know, you can't really... This is how I look at it. I, I blame the people who believe it. Right? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're culpable. Yes, yes. Yeah. Like, you know, I've always been that type of person to look back and, and, and analyze and assess and say, this isn't working for me. Right? How how are your pockets getting fatter and richer and, and my, I'm not? You know, so I've always been... No, I, I'm the same way. That person... Um, I always I always find it disturbing that there are certain pieces of misinformation that are easily reproduced and repeated, especially things that are clearly against somebody's best interest. Um, like I've, I mean, I've heard you know poor people argue against programs that are designed specifically to help them, and it's just kind of frustrating because it's marketed in a way that it's going to help other people who they have been indoctrinated with that yeah. yes you you get that very well but but yeah that's unfortunate that's a divide and conquer tactic that has been used since the beginning of time um against black people versus white people white people versus white people black people versus black people Nate, like this divide and conquer thing has always been um a very useful tool for some people yeah, I mean, they keep doing it because it's extremely effective. Mm -hmm. It works generation after generation. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's partly why uh, the movie They Live is probably my favorite film of all time. Oh, for sure, for yeah. sure, absolutely. Yeah, but, you know, getting back, people, they live. Yeah. We should live stream that, like with comments. Yeah, I mean, we'd have to, we'd have to keep the film itself on complete silent in order to do yeah. that. But it's doable. I almost, I tried to do something like that with Sean one time. <laughs> for turtles too, but it didn't quite work out. Uh, but I think I, I think I know how to do it now. I'm not. But anyway, it'd have to be you know pure commentary, right? So that'd be like a headphone setup. But we we could probably do that though. <laughs> um, but yeah, I uh, it's you know we're all the human race. Clearly, um, we as human beings, we look like phenotypically, we look like where our ancestors migrated to, right? Mm -hmm. We all come from Africa. We all have that black ancestor for those uh, racists in the crowd who think they are pure blooded, whatever you are sadly mistaken. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Um, I did my recent DNA and um, I don't, some, I was shocked by some of it, but most was pretty spot on, you know, we, most black people we know, um, but, but yeah, so we all have a common ancestor. Um, that, that started in Africa and then people began to migrate out. And then phenotypically, we look like where our, our ancestors stayed, right? So you have those traits that, that benefit you as a result of the weather, everything from your hair texture, right, to your skin color. Yep. And um, that's just how it works, right? We're, we're all um, in that same image. But again, that divide and conquer tactic is pretty pretty useful yeah no it tends to pay dividends for people in power um, I forget the name there's also a movie uh, about a labor dispute from the 20s or from like the World War One era uh, it's set in Chicago I think it's called The Killing Floor I haven't seen that one but I'm interested yes yeah, made by PBS it was a movie from the 80s um, that one shows how the workers at butchery shops would play white workers against black workers um, in order to prevent them from organizing for better wages. And um, I think eventually the workers were able to meet together and you know work on that, but uh, just playing up the prejudice there almost completely yeah. nixed that labor movement. So, I mean, those divide and conquer tactics are extremely effective. Yeah, they are, they are. I'll have to check that movie out for sure, but that sounds like, you know, certain circumstances that occurred during the populist movement in the United States with Eugene Debs, mm -hmm. uh, the farmers, and it, it wasn't successful, but it, it had some steam. But it sounds like uh, that's pretty much what happened. David Rodiger uh, does a lot of research about about that. Um, when, when black Americans began to migrate from the South to the North during the war years for the war industries, you had a lot of conflict 
with Europeans coming in and labor disputes, individuals wanting uh, equal pay, individuals not for giving that equal pay. So hey, that sounds pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then I guess, you know, going back to especially slavery in America, I mean, you, know, you can see that too with the way that poor whites became complicit in a system that didn't really do anything for them except make them feel like they're a rung above another group of people. Yes, yes, that 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 is pretty much what those politicians aimed to do at the time. Like I mentioned Fitzhugh and Hammond and Calhoun, um, just to name a few. Um, but that that was what the, the basically what their literature says. I'm a woman of primary sources. I, I go right to the source, and um, they talk about that. They say like a, they they are indoctrinating these poor whites with your skin color being a badge of privilege, right? The curse of ham. These people are here, and you are here because of your skin color, right? right. So, yeah, you're right about that. That was intentional. Um, clearly, all lies, right? But very, but but people believed it. People believed it, and it became an ideology, and it became a justification, and it carried over. It carried over, right? Um, I mean, it was it was part of. Um, I mean, an ideology, some people still say today, you know, it, in fact, that was the biggest part of desegregation in some of the, the branches of the government in the military. It was black officers being over, uh, white candidates and cadets that, that was a big deal. Like this, this, this black person, man or woman who's in charge is being over everyone else. That, that was a really big problem with desegregating the military. Yeah, uh, people took offense to that because, again, it goes back to that that ideology. Uh, people are taught something. You know, sometimes it's hard to break it. You know, and sometimes it's not. Yeah, I think that was when Truman desegregated the army. Was that before or after 1948 election? That. That was after. Okay. That was after. Yeah, that was after. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean, I know that was a, a huge deal at mm -hmm. the time, and mm -hmm. um, from what I understand, and that I was guess the you, same year actually. I mean, you'd know more about this than I would. That's but, that's when he desegregated it. All right. So yeah, yeah, 1949. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 48. All oh, 48. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's also uh, so you know, Teddy Roosevelt started allowing black people into the civil service, and then was it Woodrow Wilson kind yes. of. Yes, yes, yes. Can't, you know, reverse that. Yes, yes, yes. Thomas Woodrow Wilson, indeed. Um, you know, Woodrow Wilson, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to try not to go on a tangent about Woodrow Wilson, <laughs> but he had some very um, egregious opinions, all right? J. Edgar Hoover actually is intertwined with Woodrow Wilson. He, yeah, most people don't know that. J. Edgar Hoover um, started out at the Library of Congress um, as just, uh, a lone uh, researcher and worked his all, way all the way up to become the J. Edgar Hoover that we know of, right? As today, <laughs> buildings named after him, right? The FBI. But um, yeah, Woodrow Wilson, um, classmates with Thomas Dixon, um, roommates actually. Um, the book, The Klansman, Birth of a Nation was based off of that book. Yes. So, and then of course that film is shown in the White House. The first film ever shown in the White House, uh, "Birth of a Nation," has this clan as this victorious, you know, figure saving the South from the blacks and the, you know, the all this type of da dun da dun da dun. You know. Yeah, I think what was it Wilson called it history written with lightning. Yes, or something, yes, you know? yes, yes. Yeah, no, uh, Wilson is probably one of the more, uh, I would say. Racist. Oh, racist, yeah. Uh, uh, but also just, in many ways, fascinating figures just overall, just because I feel like he kind of does represent a lot of the contradictions of that era perfectly. Like this one person that you know, sort of embodies all the contradictions and hypocrisy of America as it was in the early 20th century. I would agree with that. And it's, it's embarrassing as academics 
that he was one of us. He was one. I, I don't put him over on, on my side. <laughs> but <laughs> you, know, just, you can have him. Oh. He was a president of Princeton, right? He, yeah. he you know, and, it, and, and that is the overarching issue, Derek, that I think I have with with this this ideology of of ignorance is that oftentimes it comes from people who are well read mm -hmm. right right mm -hmm. i'm 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 open to a person's opinion but i don't like when people create their own facts and distort yeah. information and because when people are well read they have the ability to do that like scientific racism comes from people who are, are, are well read. This yeah. idea of drapedomania was by a physician. His last name is Cartwright. He created this idea. It's called drapedomania. So when slaves would run away and want their freedom, he diagnosed them with drapedomania. So it wasn't slavery that they were trying to get their yeah. head. <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, if you're not if you're not happy with intolerable circumstances, you're the problem. Yes. You should uh, you should adapt yourself yes, to man. this horror. Um, it's the problem for me. Like I said, um, the good academics who can disagree with policy and ideas and not get personal and just deal with the facts is something that I, I truly appreciate. Um, but unfortunately, so many of us, they have misinformation. Um, the New England Journal of Medicine was one of the front runners in pushing some of this scientific racism, like black people have extra this and extra that their yeah. skin texture is tougher. So you don't have to pr like this. These are lies, right? These are lies. We all have the same blood. We all have the same pain tolerance. Yeah. But unfortunately, it comes from people with letters behind their names, like PhD. You and I yeah. earned that. And we need to start separating um, some of those people who are incorrect with people who are correct. Yeah, and it also I think there's a, a heavy burden when you have an advanced degree to not try to prognosticate about things that you don't truly know. And then you try to rely upon your personal authority to sell it to people who will assume that you're more correct than you are. Mm. Uh, like, I, there's a notorious example. Um, there's a guy who is very Islamophobic. His name is Bill Warner. He's got a PhD in mechanical engineering or something like that. And if you look at his site long enough, you see that. But he portrays himself as an expert on Islam. So he's one of those guys who, you know, presents the Quran in a fairly literal way that you look historically it's rarely been actually applied that way no yes it does say to read it literally mm. but you can look at all of the islamic empires including mali and see that they rarely actually enforce islamic law in a literal sense because it's just not practicable mm -hmm. um, but he is one of those guys who preaches about the global caliphate and all this other you know kind of out there stuff and because he's got the phd people take him far more seriously mm -hmm. than they should mm -hmm. um uh, but speaking of scientific racism, there actually is a precedent for that in Greece. Ah. Um, and this is probably, this is also how you know that men were the determining factor of what was culture in ancient Greece. So they would take Thracians and others to slave markets, and they would portray them nude and you know buy them and sell them. Well, uh, what the Greeks noticed is that the Thracians and the people they were taking captive tended to have larger penises than they did. So... What do we make of this? Well, obviously, having a large penis is a bad thing because it means that you're more likely to become enslaved. So the reason is because these guys with these larger penises clearly are oversexed. And because they're so oversexed, that's why they've been less successful and why they've been captured in war. Interesting. So clearly having a smaller penis is superior, and that's why you notice the Greek statues Apollo and all the other gods are not particularly well hung. Interesting. It's not a coincidence. Interesting. Yeah. That is an interesting um, explanation on why those statues appear the way they do. And that's also a verification that people with the power can make the rules. Yeah. Because that is definitely an opinion. I will tell you this. What you just said 
correlates to a lot of the lynchings that happened in the United States. And I have information about this on my website. So very sadistic, but almost every time a male, right? Cause women were lynched as well, but almost every time a male is lynched, a black male is lynched, his genitalia is cut off. Yes. Okay, I didn't realize that. Absolutely. Um, it's it's very interesting how I mean of course other body parts are you know extracted as well but the male the black male's penis is is cut off oftentimes during these lynchings and what I like about um, the way it's documented in the newspaper because the the book by Ginsburg um, highlights it very well um, journalists write about it. You know, it's it's not a secret. It's put on postcards. It's, you know, it's it's documented. It's you know, vicious. Yes. Yeah, that's. And it's passed around like a treasure trove, like a toy. Ooh. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Very interesting. Well, I know some of those lynch mobs were brutal, and uh, you know, the story, one story that stuck with me. I learned it as an undergrad doing uh, North Carolina history. Is uh, you know. Wilmington race riot mm-hmm. where you know there was the false report uh, a woman had gotten pregnant and she was ashamed to tell her family that you know she had been having an affair with somebody so instead she made up a story that she'd been raped by a black guy mm. so this got a mob worked up and I think they killed what was it 120 black mm-hmm. men before mm-hmm. she finally confessed oh yeah it's actually just some white guy I, yeah. you know had yeah. an affair with and from what I understand uh, the public who had done all these lynchings at that point, they based the white public that is, of course, they said, well, at least we put them in their place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that that actually is a fact. You're right. In fact, yeah. um, politicians spoke about that often. This was a method of, quote unquote, putting people in their place. Like, you know, yeah. not having them to s- step out of line, you know, and that's, that's, a, that's sick. Right, but that's the history that that people don't like to talk about. But the United States, you know, that was a brutal time period, right? And in fact, the United States is very go back to being hypocritical. We go from a time period of slavery where, you know, enslavers and all these people have black people nursing their children, you know, breastfeeding black women, breastfeeding white babies and, you know, black men in the house and out doing all these things in close proximity to almost overnight being villains. Like, how does that happen? You know, it's it's very peculiar, you know, by reconstruction, Black people are the big bad wolf, but you know, during slavery, everything was, you know, close proximity and, and I, let's be clear, you know, men were taken advantage of as well, right? Some yeah. of those, those enslaved men were, we, that's right, right? When you unwillingly want to participate in a sexual act with a woman, that, that is rape. And some of these black men were raped by, by white women. Right, some of those older white women, some of those younger white women, but you clearly can't say no. What are you gonna no, you do? You don't really have a choice. Yeah. So exploitation happened on on both ends. I want to be clear about that. I was looking at, and I hope I saved it. And I might put this on my website, but it's kind of provocative. So I, in fact, I probably won't. But I was I was uh, doing some research in the archives, and I came across a, a picture of. He was a slave owner, appeared to be one, and he was sitting with his legs gapped, common male position when they sit, you sit. And there was a little boy sitting. There's no misunderstanding with this, all right? I'm I'm like there's no misunderstanding this interpretation in this image. He was provocatively sitting between his legs. Right, like anyone, you don't need a PhD to see this. Anyone who would look at this image would automatically say this is inappropriate, okay? Mm-hmm. Automatically. So stuff like that was was definitely um, 
jarring for me. I come across a lot of that when I when I'm looking through the archives. Just a lot of just provocative images like that. Um, I was doing research on um, like how healthcare was started and you know gynecology and stuff like that was started on black women and you know how you test stuff yeah Harriet Washington does that research but I was kind of deviating from her work a little bit but yeah it's interesting stuff yeah, yeah. no it is it's um yeah there's, it's amazing within you know a fairly recent amount of time how many just awful practices have been perpetrated just in the world immediately around us uh, crazy to think about how do you think religion influenced Rome the Romans and the Greeks when it came to slavery how do you think religion influenced that well there wasn't a great deal of interaction but there was a little bit in the sense that um, in the Greek world, especially whenever you brought a new slave in, you would actually make them an official part of your oikos or household. So the way you would do that is you would have them parade around your uh, mantelpiece where your household gods would be. And so that made it to where, even though obviously you know being a slave is terrible, the household, the you know, mother and father of the household would now have an obligation to care for this person if they were ill. Uh, so, if, so if the slave came down ill, then usually the woman of the house would be responsible for tending to him while he gets better. So there was this idea that the slave was integrated into the family and then they sort of swore before the gods that they were now a you know, part of the family. That being said, obviously, uh, even in Athens where you have this as the norm, when the Spartans set up a fort near in Attica and said, if you escape here, you can be free and go wherever you want, most of the slaves left. It's like, you think? It's like when the Union Army arrives in the <laughs> South. <you know? laughs> they free themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, even though even though they're actually, I guess, you know, you should call them protections for right. slaves in a way, it still obviously is not the same as being free. Right. Um, which is, which brings yeah. me to the point you said that, like, when the men are all fighting this civil war, you have some, most slaves just left to free themselves, but you had all these some black people still kind of hanging around white people with with no type of wall between them you know it's it's very just hypocritical and peculiar how people don't realize that these things are moving at the same time but then you know ideologies are put in place and justifications are put in place you know what do you think the big misconception about greek and roman history and slavery uh, is. In terms of the s slavery in Greece and Rome, um, in the Roman world, I'd say the biggest misconception is a lot of people don't know about how common manumission was. So mm -hmm. Roman slavery could be brutal, mm -hmm. but um, most, oh, at least a pretty high percentage of people would be freed at some point. Another thing that I guess a little nuance gets lost is that once you're freed, you still have obligations to your former master as mm -hmm. a freedman, mm -hmm. but your kids don't. Mm. So once your kids come of age, they are just free people. Mm. And there's and also when you're a freedman and a freeman, you're a citizen. Mm. So you get automatic citizenship. So actually, Roman slavery has a rosier outlook in the end. Greek slavery um, tends to be easier on a day to day basis, but you have fewer opportunities to get out of it. Uh, that being said, uh, some people have tried to paint a rosier picture recently because they looked at the examples of a couple banking slaves, and both of the great bankers of Athens in the 4th century happened to die without kids, so the citizens agreed to something extremely rare, freeing these slaves and letting them inherit those estates and then become citizens, and not only citizens, but among the wealthiest. And in general in the Greek world, it is almost impossible to win citizenship if you're not born somewhere, to the point that one of the few people who won a citizenship in Athens was Herodotus and he literally had to invent history to become a citizen <laughs> and that is a history by the way where obviously he talks about how great Athens is mm. at length <laughs> so unless you're doing unless you're willing to go to those limps you're not winning freedom and there were some slaves and also uh, out, uh, medics or outsiders who are citizens of other places who helped the Athenians restore their democracy after the mm. Peloponnesian Wars. These are guys who were literally fighting 
in rags during the middle of winter Interesting. against a much superior force, and they eventually prevail. Well, they were granted citizenship, and then several years later, the Athenians get back together, and they said, actually, do those guys really deserve it? Interesting. Nah. Ax <laughs> them from the rolls. So, yeah. Um, it, it's it, So in Athens and everywhere else in the Greek world, because of the jealousy over citizenship, you don't have a ton of opportunities to get away from it. In Rome, you do, but you might die before you get there. Oh, and another, another thing in general about the Greeks, not just about slavery, but in general, the misconception is that the idea is that the Romans are warlike, the Greeks are more balanced and a little bit oh. more peaceful and thoughtful. But again, like I was talking about with Greek colonization, mm -hmm. uh, the Greeks celebrate violence. Mm. And during the classical Athenian period, they were at war two out of every three years. Interesting. So this is not a peaceful people. And also, they're, it's not quite their Bible, but it's kind of like an equivalent in a way. Uh, the thing that they see as a kind of moral, ethical guide is the Iliad and the Odyssey, mm. which are all about killing people. Interesting. So the Greeks are just as violent as the Romans are. They're just not as organized about it. Mm -hmm. That's the big difference. Yeah. Interesting. You know, the northern states practice manumission. Yeah. Um, so you do have that process because, of course, you know, the north had slavery 100%. And then without slavery, those northern factories don't operate. So... Oftentimes, people are confused about that. You know, they've been taught that it's North versus the South, yeah. right? And it's like, no, the South left the federal government, okay? You had a significant amount of Southern states who remained loyal to the Union. In fact, that's how Andrew Johnson became our vice president. He became, he was loyal to the Union as, as governor of Tennessee. Um, the the mayor of New York, Wood, wanted to succeed, not be a part of the, the South, but succeed because he was making so much money uh, from Southern cotton. So I think that that's a big misconception is, is that the, it was this big split, North versus South and slavery versus anti-slavery. And it's like, that's not true. Those Northern factories were operating off Southern cotton. Um, and you know money was involved however clearly manumission and paying people wages for their labor um was needed right was needed yeah another thing that I, I find interesting about the civil war period is especially if you talk to the kinds of people who are like really in the southern pride and the legacy of the south they seem to have this impression that uh you know people in the South in general were 100% on board with the Confederacy. And I mean, there was enough support, obviously, to keep it going for four years, but you also have to look at desertion rates. And those desertion rates were pretty high, especially in places like North Carolina, which mm -hmm. is about 50%. Absolutely. And partly it's because they only seceded in the first place because their neighbors all did. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so then once the war really starts going bad, you start seeing these North Carolina units filter out. And you also note that there are very few elite units from North Carolina in the war. That's right. I mean, there's, I think, one regiment called the Big Bethel or something like that. Yes, and yes, there's yes. basically nothing else. And there's a reason for that. It's because they're not that into it. Mm -hmm. Because there aren't that many huge plantations in the state. And uh, also the mountain region, both North Carolina and Tennessee, mm -hmm. people there really don't support the war. Mm -hmm. I mean, in East Tennessee, it was Union country. That's right. Absolutely. And, of course, that's how we get West Virginia. West Virginia yeah. succeeds from Virginia <laughs> during the Civil War because yeah. they didn't want to be a part of that clown car. So they're out. Yeah. Right? And now you see rebel flags all over the place it's there, which is weird. But You know, and that and that's something I'm working on, Derek, is this, this trend, this ideology and this chain. And that part of that is the Daughters of the Confederacy, you know, but... This change of the Civil War over time has completely taken on um, um, this this the, this new narrative. You know, it, this narrative about you know it not being about slavery, or this narrative that everyone supported the Civil War. In fact, Jefferson Davis, when he was Senator of Mississippi and appointed, I will say, appointed president of the Confederacy, he didn't want it. He thought it was not a good idea to succeed, right? He was, he was, he spent a long time trying to um, keep the Union together, North and South, that is, and people are, you know, they just don't understand the facts 
And unfortunately, going back to what we spoke about a moment ago, a lot of this misinformation comes from people who claim to be Civil War buffs, right? They read it and, and unfortunately, I just go to the primary documents, right? <laughs> Alexander yeah. Stevens, Cornerstone speech. Um, I go to the, the articles of secession. I just, I prefer the primary documents. If you want to know why someone did what they did, they will tell you. That's the beautiful thing about history mm-hmm. is that people wrote everything down. And it's, it's, you know, if possible, it's always best to look at stuff that's as contemporary as possible rather than like later memoirs that are serving uh, an agenda of making one look better oh, in yes. retrospect. Uh, that one thing I've noticed, uh, just even doing sort of basic research for a list about generals from like World War One is that mm-hmm. their impression of people at the time is different than their impression later. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times they do play a lot of politics when they're writing memoirs. Oh yes. And and if you're a fan of the person, right, you you, you tend to forget all the bad stuff that they did. Yeah. You know, and and it's it's hard it's hard to be critical and objective towards someone that you really like. You know, you want to highlight all the good stuff. So that's a human trait, but you still have to recognize it, right? You you do. You still have to recognize it. And that's something, when people have the knowledge and, you know, they're they're fans of a certain general, especially in the South, it happens. You know, people are big fans of of the Civil War. That's all they want to talk. And that's okay. Yeah, or, or the idea that, uh, you know, the people had for a long time that, like, Robert E. Lee was uh, right up there with Alexander and Hannibal and Caesar and, you know, the great captains. It, you know, it just, I mean, it's just fanboyism. It is. Which, because uh, just looking at it, if you're just looking at it militarily, Lee was a good tactician, but he's not on the same tier as those guys. It's just a ridiculous comparison. He lost Gettysburg. And also Antietam, which I think was mm-hmm. more egregious because it was a terrible idea to fight there in the mm-hmm. first place. Mm-hmm. And Lee didn't want... His father, by the way, was a... There's, I'll just say there's a lot of black people in the DMV area that are related to Robert E. Lee. I'll yeah, just put dad, it that uh, way. <laughs> yeah. His dad got around. <laughs> I'll just put it that yeah, way. Like horse Harry Lee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of black relatives of Robert E. Lee in that area. But yeah, people in the South, they, they like their Robert E. Lee, and that's okay. You know, he didn't want to succeed either. He yeah. was one of those people who thought it was a bad idea. Lincoln tried to get him on the Union side and uh, for the federal government, but he clearly, a Virginian, said, absolutely not. I can't do that, yeah. you know, for obvious reasons. But uh, yeah, people, are they fanboy out against the Jefferson Davis, you know, and when I when I talk to students about Davis, um, you know, and I introduce them to the Zach Johnson comment, and they've never heard of him, I say, oh, if you've never heard about Joseph Johnson, excuse me, I said Zach Joseph Johnson, like you you can't talk about Jefferson Davis because that was part of the reason uh, why some of those strategies in the South didn't work out because of Joseph Johnson and and <laughs> yeah. and, and and Davis not getting along internal conflict so yeah people fanboy out on on it and you know it's also interesting because really outside of you know lee and jackson and longstreet the people who really talk about how great the confederate generals are they kind of run out of examples after that (laughs) so it's because most of them actually weren't that good you just even in a purely military sense i mean there are some people who are competent but few of them really stand out Mm mm-hmm and I mean, to be fair, the Union generals mostly are not that great either because mm-hmm. most of these guys are just engineers who had never led more than a few hundred men before, and now they're trying to command 50 to 80,000 man armies, and it just didn't, they didn't make the transition very smoothly. Coming across, well, I mean, yeah, what you said has a little bit of credence because Lincoln originally, you know, enlisted men for 90 days. He said, this is going to be a quick situation. Yeah. It didn't work out, right? But when you, you have um, the Confiscation Acts and the Militia Acts, uh, 1861, 1862. You know, black men are now fighting, you know, and black women, excuse me, Harriet Tubman, of course. Yeah. Um, so, it's yeah, it's it just wasn't a, a, a well-planned-out situation. Um, but, 
you know, clearly I am happy with the outcome, um, yeah. obviously. But the southern states thought they would have more allies. Clearly England, a lot of that cotton is going over to England uh, yeah. at the time. So they figured England uh, and, and other European nations would ally with them. But they said, <laughs> this is between A and B. I am going to see my way out of this. And I can get my cotton from India, Egypt. Somewhere and, else. And, I mean, the whole thing is, too, the, the Confederate government was largely incompetent. Uh, so even if they had won independence, I'm not really sure what they would have done with it. Well, the ultimately, they would have wanted to create something called the Golden Circle. So link up with Brazil. Slavery doesn't end there until 1888. So link uh-huh. up with Brazil, Cuba. Um, create this entire slaveocracy that goes down through the Caribbean. Of course, Haiti has its independence now. We, you know, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole, but they are high 80, you know, by 1804. But um, ultimately, the goal, they thought they could survive because of the, the wealth in a few, right? In a yeah. few. But no, what you said is what the general said at the time. So you're not being biased with that comment, Derek. Like Jefferson, go back and read the documents by Jefferson Davis and other people who thought it wasn't a good idea to succeed. Okay, now once it happened, you're in it, right? The die is cast, but no, originally people thought it was a bad idea, but again, over time it has taken on its own narrative that, oh, everyone wanted to succeed and this is the greatest idea ever, and and that's just not a fact. That's just not a fact. Uh, Governor Brownlow, even Governor Brownlow, uh, in Tennessee, after the Civil War, I mean, took it upon himself to to execute rebel soldiers with impunity. Like it, it just wasn't this solidified brouhaha that that people have have made it out to be. And I think some of that comes from people, family members may have been veterans of the Confederacy, and stories are passed down over generations, over generations, and. People have that right to feel that way, but again, it doesn't make it a fact. Yeah, I mean, even if they were to create, you know, this golden circle thing, I mean, still garrisoning all that, especially if the North decided to renew the war effort later on, I mean, how do you defend all this territory if you're trying to Mm -hmm. enslave a massive amount of people with a pretty small group of white people? It just isn't really feasible. I mean, it kind of runs into the overextension problem that you would see with the Germans in World War II or even with uh, the Neo-Assyrians. Mm-hmm. It's just mm-hmm. when you rule in this way where it's just purely through force and you have enemies on every side of you, you eventually will falter because you're not going to win every battle and mm-hmm. you have a thin bench mm-hmm. and also a population that's more than willing to kick you out. So it's just not a very viable model. Absolutely. It, it's not. It's not. But pride is, well, that's biblical right pride yeah. comes before the fall so yeah at, at a point you know it, it is pride it is pride because you know ultimately among other things the biggest variable is when Winfield Scott you know creates the, you know the anaconda plan basically and it, it does everything that you basically just said um, you know surround the south you know cut down the middle and then General Sherman well it takes care of business, right? Yeah. So, yeah, it, it, it's a tough, it's a tough model to withstand. But, um, you know, it took four years to to get things handled. Yeah, and I guess when I think about it, there are, I mean, there have been some pretty flawed governmental models that have lasted for longer than they should. I mean, you know, the Austro-Hungarian Empire comes yes. to mind. Yes. The uh, Holy Roman Empire. There's a bunch of them that really should not have held together, but still. Um, yeah, I, I, that's one thing I've never quite understood is the you know valorization of the Confederacy. It's just not a good model. Yeah, I you know as a as a as a university professor who teaches American history regularly, I can honestly say I understand where the valor comes from. Yeah. Because it's all that has been taught, 
it's all perspective because yeah. even when I introduce it is and, and that's that doesn't make it right, right because yeah. I say I get it <laughs> that doesn't mean I agree or I make it right I, I'm just saying that I if you constantly feed someone uh, a message that that's all you know right so even when I introduce the concept of California at this time Students are like, wait, what's going on in California? Like Native Americans are being slaughtered and sold on an auction block in the West Coast, right? Um, when I talk about, you know, places like Oregon banning black people. Um, so, like, I just, like, people have no other, even when I introduce the concept, when we talk about Manifest Destiny, and I, and I say, hello, there's people there. It's not empty. Mexicans are there. Yeah. Our Mexican brothers and sisters are there. Our Native American brothers and sisters are there. There are some black people over there. Not all black people are enslaved, right? You have mm -hmm. a nice size free population. So um, when I talk about Manifest Destiny, from a very important objective standpoint, I, I get bubble eyes like what do you mean like what the heck do you think i mean like people yeah. are there they're called human beings yeah, that's what right? it's like for all my life it's been america <laughs> no no it's it's important to to respect both sides of this that doesn't mean you're pushing an agenda it just means you understand that there are people on the other side of this place that you're saying god has manifested you to get because god like god loves indians god loves mexicans you know he likes everybody. He likes black people. God didn't tell you to enslave black people. You did that, right? Yeah. So those are those are personal choices foiled into all that ideology that's bad and incorrect. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, well, people like to use religious texts creatively when they need to figure out a way to justify something. So it's, it's interesting, you know, the abolitionists had their reading of the Bible on the subject, and then their side had their reading. And they were each able to find what they were looking for. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I have that on my. I had that on my. Uh, um, I have it actually still there. It's on my website where I, I, I posted how the Southern Baptist became Southern Baptist, and I'll just leave it at that because some of this is new material for people, Derek, and it, it's jarring when they hear it. Um, so. That's why I always encourage people to do their own research. Go a little bit past Google if you can. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't mean you're bashing anything. It just means you're telling the facts. Yeah. And telling the facts doesn't mean you're pushing a narrative. It doesn't mean that you're against something or for something. It just means you're telling the facts. Okay? It's it's important. And in fact, it's it's important that you're able to criticize something that you appreciate. Okay, that just means you're being fair. Yeah. You know, it's it's important. Hey, I'm a Michael Jordan fan, right? I remember when he dropped 63 on Boston, yeah, right? Yeah. But I can also say, man, I wish you would have never went to the Wizards. <laughs> yeah. You would have stopped. I can criticize my man mm. and say, bro, I love you. People who know me know I I I was a Michael Jordan fanatic. And I would be in someone's face if they ever said anything bad about Mike. But I could also say, why did you come back and go to the Wizards, man? See, I guess I have a, a somewhat different opinion on that. Because I actually think his Wizard run was not that bad oh. overall. I mean, because there were games where, you know, clearly he wasn't the same anymore. There were other games that were his, like, throw, throwback to... Uh, his Bulls days, like, yeah. I think it was he dropped 50 the week before he turned 40 he or something did, like that. So, I mean, he did, He also did. had that ridiculous block where he literally snatched the ball from uh, somebody from, in midair. Yeah, he did. Which, I don't think anybody's ever done that before or since. Um, yeah, yeah, I do remember that. In fact, that that's probably one of my favorite uh, Jordan blocks. I will put LeBron's um, backboard chase down blocks up there with those. I like yeah, those chase down blocks. Those. <laughs> those, those are the, those are nasty. Those are, jeez, yeah. give me a break. Yeah. I would just pull the ball out if I seen LeBron behind me. I just back it up and just let the team run down like shoot a three. Yeah. That's the only time I will authorize a, a three point on a fast break is when LeBron is chasing behind you yeah. out of fear of that chase down block. Yeah, I guess it also it also depends too on uh you know who you got open for the three. 
Um, because I think now that you know the way the NBA works is you pretty much have to take it no matter who you are if you're open. Um, <laughs> That's the evolution of the NBA, yes. 2023. I mean, hell, at this point, if you're even if you're a center, if you can't shoot an open three, you can't be a starter anymore. Right. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. You got seven footers. Yeah, Jokovic. Yeah. 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 So I mean, you might not. You don't have to know to be a sniper. You got to be able to make an open one. Absolutely. Uh, which is kind of a crazy evolution compared to you know 90s basketball where it seemed like anybody over about six foot eight couldn't shoot outside of the <laughs> right. paint you didn't have to though <laughs> yeah, right true. You didn't ha- people had their positions uh back in the day the league was built around big men right it was you know the point guard magic kind of changed that but back in the day it was it was all about you built a team around the center right yeah. centers were drafted you built a team around them, and that's how you won. And then things change, right? The evolution yeah. of that. And I like that. I like the evolution yeah. of, of sports. Like some people are, you know, back in my day. You know, I mean, a lot of the evolution was precisely because of how dominant Jordan was. A hundred percent. Very much like baseball. Yeah. They moved. And, and basketball, right? Because of uh, Chamberlain. They, they moved yeah. the, the, <laughs> the damn free throw a lot. Uh, well, speaking of centers and, you know, how, like, Jordan's And baseball, was... they moved the, the mound because of Bob Gibson. Oh, I couldn't know that. Oh, yeah. So, you're right. It, it is. It, players are dominant. Yeah. Well, I mean, my favorite story about Jordan Pippen, you know, in the backup center for the Bulls during the second three-peat was Bill Winnington. <laughs> yes. And my favorite story about Bill is uh, literally he was instructed, don't ever stand in the paint. Because then you'll just block Pippen or Jordan when they're trying to dunk. Right. So he was literally instructed to remain about 12 feet out of the paint. Uh, so, he had a nice jump shot. Oh, yeah. His yeah. baseline jumper was great. Yeah. But, uh, he also, you know, he also he wasn't terrible. I mean, he was decent at a few things. But when you have Jordan and Pippen on your team, whatever skills he has as a center are relevant. Right, and right. Whatever he can do is not going to be as good as leaving the paint open for them to go dunk. Right. Role players. Absolutely. So, those Those role players. But I can't imagine you imagine being a seven footer in the age of big men, and it's like, okay, your role in this team is get the out of the way. <laughs> yes. So that way, um, Jordan or Pippen can dunk easier. Yeah, absolutely. And draw your defender away from the paint, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, the Jordan rules. Yeah, I remember yeah. that book came out. But no, it 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 is. It is when when great players are great, God given talent and hard work. Excuse me, Jordan was a hard worker. Um, that is a six gear that that only a certain group of people understand. Yeah. Right? It's it's a self determination. It's a self discipline. But that that is pretty much it. It is it is those the great players. Like when the quarterback began to to start running out of the pocket, like Mike Vick, right? People, yeah. old fogies are well. He thinks he's a running back. Oh. Like that's like. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to introduce you to Sean sometime because he has he's he pines for the days of the running back. Oh. Uh, you know, having a big role in the offense. Oh yeah, good luck with that, right? Yeah. That that's not that's that's. I mean, uh, the running back is still needed. You know. Yeah. We we need the the running back, but those days when you could give. My favorite running back, Barry Sanders of all time. You could give him the ball, and he would punch it in, and just hand the ball to the ref, and just keep it moving. Those days, those days are over. Um, yeah, the quarterback is now scrambling out of the pocket. Uh, the tight end is now a wide receiver almost. It's yeah, those days are over. But that's good. That's good. We should all evolve. Yeah, because I don't watch a ton of football, but it's always been fascinating to me, you know, the relative trajectories of careers, because if you compare with basketball, I mean, a lot of people will play for a long time, Mm -hmm. regardless of what position, but in, you know, football, if you're playing something other than quarterback, it seems like your career is maybe five years. Not for long. Yeah, if you're a quarterback, I mean, you can be in your 40s and still be dominant. Uh, Yeah, if you have a good line, absolutely, if you have a good line. That's what people say, you know, NFL stands for not for long. But, but yeah, yeah. I'll I wonder how 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 the Romans stacked up with that. I mean, well, I know like with the Olympic athletes, well, the ancient Olympic athletes, usually they only had one or two cycles, really. But fortunately for them, there were other games every year. So not only do you have the Olympics every four years, but you have like 
the Nemean, Isthmian, and Pythian games. Interesting. So you actually could make a reputation, but you maybe have about eight or nine years, probably. Um, and that's assuming that you're training full-time, which also means, of course, you have to be born wealthy or have a sponsor occasionally. Um, and then if you win a gold medal, the big prize is that for the rest of your life you eat for free at public expense and you get to wear a you know a garland around oh. for the rest of your life. So basically you just get to be a hero <laughs> nice. uh, in an official capacity. So not just like if Michael Jordan walks in and people go crazy, but he would wear a crown, not a crown, but like a garland. And oh, then, really? you know, people would make way like, here's Michael Jordan. He's our gold medalist. Uh, give him uh, some food and give him some wine. <laughs> you know, um, so that's that's what they were going for. And then they get an inscription with their name on it. They also got the inscription at Olympus. So they get in the history books as a victor. So I mean, it's like a whole prestige thing. Um, and it's very much the idea that the gods are watching and this is, uh, it makes you the greatest of the Greeks, this one thing. Um, so it's it's kind of the same thing as glory, but it's all about legacy because obviously they're not doing it for money in the same way. So it'd be like just purely basing uh, everything on accolades. Because I mean, obviously there are plenty of athletes today, if you, know, you ask them, well, why don't you win a championship? And then their response is, well, look at the house I live in. I mean, <laughs> I'm a winner, you know, so. <laughs> but if you played in a certain era, your answer would be Michael Jordan. Right, because there yeah. were some great players, man. Barkley, you know, Patrick Ewing, Sean Kemp, like some of those guys. Peyton, Gary yeah. Peyton, first. Um, they ju- they just came up against a buzzsaw called Michael Jordan. Yeah, it's a, it, you know, and it's it's crazy. I mean, I think the biggest victim of all was uh, Clyde the Glide oh. because you know he was another great shooting That's guard because he played the same position. He just got uh, eclipsed in terms of reputation. Yeah. I mean, Whenever you hear people talking about shooting guards now, he tends to get overlooked mm-hmm. unfairly, I think, just because he had the misfortune of playing at the same time as Jordan. Fly slamming. Yeah, I, you know, and that's why, and I wasn't a Houston fan, of course, but that's that's why I was happy that he, he was able to get that ring with, with Houston um, because uh, he, wa- he deserved it. He deserved it. Um, and that was a good team for sure. Clyde was the man. He is the man. Um, yeah. So, absolutely, I agree with that. He's got to dribble with his head up, though, right? Dribble yeah. with his head down. Well, yeah. He still was able to see. But uh, and, uh, he, uh, he, he was had... one of my favorite, man, back then. Um, yeah, they had a team. Terry Porter. They had a squad. I think, was it still Kevin Duckworth with yeah. them, too? I mean, yeah, yeah they, had a, they had a pretty good team. Actually, all those teams Jordan faced in the finals were loaded. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, the, probably the worst team he faced was the, Mad, the uh, Lakers in 91. Yeah. Because that was post Kareem, yeah. Uh, but still, that wasn't a bad squad. I mean, he had Magic and Byron yeah. Scott, Worthy, James Worthy was still around. He was then, still the man. He was, and my, I mean, Magic and Kareem were the man. Don't get me wrong, you know, I don't want to say anything. <laughs> Those are my guys, but man, Worthy, he was a Swiss Army knife, you know, unguardable, yeah. you know, very much like uh, Robert Ory. Whatever team he played for around the league, Robert Ory. Like, he was that Swiss Army knife that could get you rebound, shoot threes, yeah. guard all these different positions. Kind of like the one of the prototypical uh, positionless play- players, yeah. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. Now, um, yeah, there are, there are guys like that. They, you know, they're not necessarily stars, but they still have this ability to contribute no matter what and just sort of blend. Um, I mean, I think, you know, like we were talking about the other day on the Bulls, I mean, Tony Kukoc was kind of that guy who yeah. could kind of do a little bit of everything. He could bring up the ball. He could – he wasn't very good at defense, but was, other than that, you know, he, on offense, he could do literally anything. Best six man ever. That's my guy. Best six man ever. Big lefty. Yep. I like that left-handed shot on those players. So, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Tony Kukoc was my, was my guy too. Big fan. Big fan. A couple game winners. I almost tore my house down watching those. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. There was a little beef with him and Pippen. I remember when he he got the last shot instead of Pippen. Yeah, I guess that all but, broke out with the last. Well, you know, it was reinitiated with the last dance. Oh yeah, that's that, right. That they did talk about appeared, it back then. Okay. Even though Jordan was in retirement when that happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot uh, they did talk about that. So I think that's really what reignited that whole uh, beef between Jordan and Pippen was that Jordan, you know, allowed that to go in the documentary. Mm. Um, They'll work it out. They'll Hopefully, it out. I hope so. Yeah. I mean, uh, but yeah, because uh, you know Jordan Pippen, uh, those are pretty much my favorite players of all time. <laughs> yes. 
Yes, they are. They are my man. Those are my guys. I I still watch my Bulls. Uh, things aren't working out as well. We did uh, win last night, but I'll stop there. <laughs> Some things could have been better. Oh but uh, I'm you know those are my guys, man, for sure. I think um, I think uh, we need a couple draft picks, but uh, you know we'll be we'll be okay. We'll definitely be okay. I think really what the Bulls need to do at this point is uh, find a fountain of youth and take Michael Jordan there because I think that's really about the only thing that's going to help them. Oh, come on. You're killing me, Small. Right. I well, think... it'll, it'll just take a long time because yeah. they, they've made some huge errors. I and know. I well, think, well, partly with the Lonzo Ball thing, that's just pure bad luck. I mean, I don't think they made a mistake there. Yeah, and then Derek Rose, we, you know, he he had some injuries. Yeah. And the, Yeah, Boozer. We've had some situations that I just could have – been better but um was boozer was it boozer who was it somebody else who uh colored in their hairline with the sharpie who was that guy i do not remember that story i think it was boozer so you know he was going to get all thin up front so he took a sharpie and colored it in but then you know it probably looked okay when he was in the mirror but then under his bright lights you could tell clearly it's a sharpie. Oh. And then um, he also started sweating. You sure it wasn't dye, hair dye? No, it, like well, it might have been some sort of bad dye, but he was putting it on a bald spot. Oh. So whatever it was was not on hair, but on skin. Oh, that's not gonna work. Yeah, and um, anyway. He started running. Yeah, it was bad, but like it was Giuliani. It was, when he was Rudolph Giuliani. Yeah, I feel like with him he Rudy. didn't give it enough time or something. I don't know how he did that, but he was sweating. He was. Yeah. He was angry. He was sweating. He was. No. Yeah. Well, I mean, to be fair, I think what he, to do that, he was offered like 20 or $30 million to take up that case. Yeah. So, I mean, you know. I think he's been disbarred. Oh, yeah. He got disbarred for that. But also, he hadn't practiced law in like 20 years, so oh, okay. he was not exactly a good choice to begin with. Yeah. It's just he was just the you know, highest profile person willing to do it. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, well, I'll make an ass of myself if you're going to pay me 20 or $30 million. I'll, yeah. I'll go out there in front of the dildo store and, you know make my case pretty he pretty much got in some trouble <laughs> we'll just say that we just pretty much got in some trouble yeah no, rudy um it's sad because like uh, going into the 2000s i mean he was america's mayor and he was this uh really kind of beloved figure who broke the mob and now you know he's become a complete punchline yeah, he was America's mayor. Um, he got into a little bit of some <clears throat> personal trouble uh, that same time that September 11th happened. Yeah, he had some personal issues with uh, his family. I would just say that. So he was going through some um, some interesting things during September 11th, personally and then publicly, because he's America's mayor. The city's attacked. Um, so man, and then. And, you know this modern situation more modern with with trump so you know and and i think he's sick now if i'm not mistaken i think he has some ailments he's battling some things but uh i think he'll still get you know he'll he'll get his recognition throughout history you know we're history professors so we understand how time can change and it heals wounds and before you know it you know people forget the bad stuff and yeah, and I mean, I guess it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to predict exactly what will be remembered because, like William Jennings Bryan, for instance. I mean, I feel like at this point he's probably better known for his involvement in the Scopes trial mm. than he is for being a presidential candidate. That is, yeah. And you know, basically the leader of the uh, populist movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, even though clearly he spent a lot more time on one thing than the other, mm-hmm. and in his own lifetime he's clearly well, but much better known, you know, <laughs> right. for one thing, but. Yeah, I think today if you just saw him in a textbook, it's almost certainly going to be on the Scopes trial. Right. Uh, and, that, well, that – don't don't get me started on that. That might have to be another conversation. Textbooks, yeah. right? Textbooks, you know? Like, yeah. I, I, I always have to supplement textbooks with additional articles, right? Because, you know, you talk about textbooks, the 49ers, right? the gold and digging out west in California. But we also need to widen that scope. You know, these guys were murderers of natives. All right. Yeah. State sanctioned, you know, Peter Burnett, like 
you know, it's important to tell the whole story. So sometimes, like you, William Jennings Bryan was a great guy. I like to study him quite a bit um, because of his brain. His lens at the time was good. You know, he had some very interesting points of view. Yeah, I didn't agree with all of them. Right. I mean, you know, of course, he's also the champion of silver and right. everything else. And I found it. I found one article that was because, especially when Trump, you know, became sort of the face of populism, then there was kind of this revisionist movement, especially on the internet, to make all previous populists like right wing and racist. And so uh, William Jennings Bryan was reimagined. They took some because uh, he, he had a thing about the working class basically being uh, was it crucified on a cross of gold or something like that. And so they made it into, they tried to pretend that was an anti-Semitic remark, which is not what it was. That's he was not. just talking about the gold standard screwing over working people. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so it's just got, it's just amazing how sometimes things can be reinterpreted. And also, you know, the fact is lost that for the most part, most of what the populist and progressive stood for was clearly, clearly more left than mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. at the time. Uh, right, right. And I just found that deeply frustrating when that started happening. Because even as someone who's not an American history expert, I knew that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a narrative right it's a narrative that's that is pushed and 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 I think it's important that people have their perspective because no one is uniform and we all have our own personalities it's important to think differently but I just give me the facts right let's let's not skew this to to make it fit your narrative right it's it's okay to say that you're happy for example i mean several people of our you know are from the southern states it's okay yeah. to say you, you are proud to be from whatever southern state of your choice but it's okay to say at this particular time those individuals were participating in something that was bad yeah yeah right and and i think that's what i like most about president jimmy carter um you know, it's hard to be different. It's hard to stand for what's right. It's hard to do that. And, you know, that is something that Jimmy Carter really tried to do during his presidency is is to say, this is a new Georgia, right? This is a new South. Let's try. And everyone's not going to be on this bandwagon. We know that because racism is taught. Bigotry is taught. No child comes into this world hating someone else thinking they're better, thinking someone's less, all that is learned behavior, right? We know this. It's learned, it's taught, it's conscious, it's unconscious, it's all taught. But what I appreciate about Jimmy Carter is that he was able to say, no, this, it was like that, but now we're, we're, we're trying to move on, right? So it's okay to, to be happy to be where you're from and and study it, but you need to be honest with yourself about the views of some people at the time. Right? Yeah. And it and some of those views, almost all of them were not good. All right. They were not good. It's also it's fascinating to me, I uh, uh learned a lot more about Jimmy Carter in the last few years, um, you know, how much of a celebrity following he had yeah. when he ran for president. Mm-hmm. Because I know Obama was critiqued at the time as, you know, being too friendly with celebrities or whatever, but actually I don't know if he actually had as much celebrity support as Carter had back in the day. Yeah, that goes back to the narrative changing, right? Yeah. You know, you're right. He was Carter had a, a huge uh, celebrity following, but you know, and this he's is followed the, by an actual celebrity. Yeah, exactly. Right? Just yeah. like Obama too. Exactly. Same deal, you know? President Obama. What he did not. What he wore a tan suit. <laughs> that's, yeah. it, that's what he well, did. Woo! Big I mean, controversy. Yeah, you know, that was uh, that was impeachable. <laughs> Twice. I yeah. Don't know. I mean, no, yeah, it's, uh, so that's actually why of the, because I guess, you know, Carter was before I was born, but still, um, you know, the presidents who've been alive in my lifetime, I, I'd say Carter is easily the one I respect the most, mm-hmm. just because I feel like you, you can judge his intentions just by how he spent his post-presidency, I think. So clearly this is not someone who's motivated by glory, greed, or anything else. He's clearly genuine. So the things he said, he must have believed. Pure Christian roots right pure christian roots um not fabricated christianity not the curse of ham and all that other stuff that yeah. justification and pretense and you know people are who they are and like i said i don't really believe in trying to make someone think the way they should think believe what you want to believe um 
but not knowing what's right can really put you in a compromising position all right like i said that student who was all about jeff davis and i i, I was all i was you know great conversation but i'm like whoa 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 you know nothing about joseph johnston you can't you yeah. need to widen that you know scope students who love the civil war and it's it's one-sided about the south and i'm like that is good keep that enthusiasm yeah. but get get another yeah, keep reading right keep yeah. reading. like i'd like that i I'd, i love when when students want to talk academics and 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 that that is all good i never shut that down i yeah. love it keep it up but you're coming off like you need to just widen the scope widen the perspective um you know understand that some of those views you know may not have been palatable for everyone else yeah and also it's interesting with the you know, talk about jeff davis being a bad commander-in-chief um and you know, one of the things Sean always likes to talk about is um, how Jeff Davis kept sabotaging Beauregard because he didn't like him personally. So Beauregard, he'd put him somewhere. Beauregard would start winning battles. Then Jeff Davis would yank him and replace him. Jo- Joseph Johnston, very similar um, situation. And that, and a lot of people don't know that. Um, that internal conflict with the southern states and the people in charge um, was a really big issue. Right, so uh, Jefferson Davis was a pretty good administrator, okay? A field commander, maybe not so much. Yeah. Right, so I think I'll, t- I'll say this. As academics, we know our strengths, right? We know our weaknesses. This woman over here is not gonna try to go perform brain surgery, but I can yeah. get you the best darn brain surgeon you know, that I know, right? Because I yeah. know I can't handle that. I think people who are secure with what they know understand what they don't know. Yeah. And that's also something I, I've never understood how there are some PhD level people who have that overweening confidence about things that are so outside of the field. Because when you learn enough to earn a PhD in something, among other things, some awareness that you should have is that the amount that you know about your subject is also the amount you don't know about a bunch of other things. And that goes to, that goes to the scientific racism. Like I yeah. said, like, like a lot. And well, yeah, we had a president, yeah. <laughs> Thomas Woodrow Wilson, who, who was the president of an Ivy league, who had some very aggressive views against some people who didn't look like him, black people. Right. Yeah. So, scientific racism comes from people with earned degree we know how hard it is to earn a phd it's not easy or any graduate degree for that matter for people who have graduate degrees at masters it's, it's not an easy feat but i think it, it is a it is an arrogance it is an overconfidence um but yeah I, you know i read a lot about scientific racism for research purposes and it and i'm it's humorous it's humorous how how people can really write this stuff um, and, and believe it, and believe it. And the most dangerous part of it is other people believe it, right? Yeah. Like I said, I read something in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, I have it bookmarked, I'll have to go back to it, um, where, you know, they're talking about the, the capacity to breathe and on skin color and all this other stuff. It's insane. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it, that's what I did when I read it. I'm chuckling. Right. This is. Yeah. No. And it's, it's also, a time period. I mean, because you know the more modern versions of that are uh, the people who do like those you know IQ by race studies. Oh or whatever. yeah. And what I what I find hilarious is that what they'll do is they might find you know because if you're studying random samples, obviously you're going to have like a little bit of variance. Just, mm-hmm. Obviously. Mm-hmm. So you get like one point difference. Right. And then they're like, therefore, <laughs> clearly. This means that we need to separate the races because, yeah. I mean, otherwise, you know, this one point of difference is going to make such a huge difference. Right. And you, you would think the margin of error that has to be well within it, most right. likely. So it really doesn't prove any point. Yeah. But they're trying to then take what they think is a point and make it into a call for radical transformation of society. That has happened... Um, more times than you know i tell you but there's been studies done on twins that have disproved iq and race 
And hey, we just had a young lady, uh, avant garde black young lady who won the spell and be so look guys like I, I, economic status is related to um, access to a variety of things, and including uh, resources and, and, and IQ, but it's not related to skin color, right? Because we yeah. know that phenotype and genotype are not related anyway, right? It's your genetic code that creates your outward appearance, and we all have the uh, similar DNA anyway, so... Yeah, people, you're right about that. That That is one thing that people... Um, and it's been justified through the years. Um, and people believe it. Um, and like I said, I read a lot about it for research purposes. And it's comedic, but it's dangerous because people believe it. You know, people believe it. Um, but I'm going to tell you, regardless to your skin color, the hard work you put in is how you produce Mm -hmm. as far as outcome and success you know yeah that's it you know skin color is definitely not um related yeah i mean you most know. of iq is a function of your environment mm -hmm. and you know, especially your nutrition when you were a kid mm -hmm. uh it has nothing to do with how much skin sunscreen yeah. you need you <laughs> right know? people uh, believe it but I just I I find also the people who really base their pride or identity on you know there's alleged racial superiority. They're always people who have literally nothing going on in their lives. <sighs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's. I think I posted that video on my website where Toni Morrison says, you know, that's that's a clear sign of insecurity, right? If you can, and I quote Toni Morrison, if you can only be tall because someone else is on your knees and you have a serious problem, right? End quote. So. Yeah, that's that's an issue that I that I've tried to leave to them because um, I'm not that kind of doctor. They need the other doctor, right? That that will help them sift through that type of problem. But it exists. I come across it all the time. Um, but those things are going to happen. You know, it's not the majority of interactions when it comes to academic conversation. Right. But I come across it for sure, for sure. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, it's, it, it is, um, I guess there aren't too many people I've run into within academia who are, you know, of that persuasion. But there is somebody on the internet who's, uh, right now he's being accused of killing his uh, wife. But um, anyway, uh, he, he's this guy who has a PhD in neuroscience and he's also... He, he basically was kicked out of the academy because he had affairs with students and things. And now, uh, yeah, <laughs> so now he's being accused of killing his wife, and he also runs a site where he is a like white supremacist. So, I mean, his life has gone as far down the toilet and off the path as you can imagine in just a few years. Not good. Yeah, so I, I <laughs> Not sometimes good. Like, horror watch that just to, you know. Not good. Yeah, that guy... Um... He needs the other doctor that we, you know, a couch yeah. to talk out some yeah, problems. Whatever prison he ends up in has that doctor. Oh, yeah, you're right. Because, uh, yeah. That is insane. That is insane. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you have anything else you wanted to cover on this topic? Or? I think we're good, man. I think All we're right. good. I think uh, the listeners have completely understood uh, the significance of these topics. We've deviated quite a bit, yeah. but that's the nature of a live conversation yeah. with a bunch of big brains with a lot of information about different topics. Yeah, I mean, we got to, we got to Jordan. We got <laughs> I to, can help uh, it. You know, Not bad. You know, we, got to all the, we got all the destinations <laughs> we needed to get to. Stop having live conversations with me, man. My That's, that's pretty much how all my conversations happen. Um, you know, it, it, it's pretty <laughs> sporadic. Oh, well, by the way, you know, they uh, Bob Gibson, the picture's mound. Yeah, they moved him back because of yeah. him. <laughs> You're like, oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. But, but, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, the Wilt Chamberlain record, the, you know, the rules that exist Fala. because Wilt Chamberlain yeah. are insane. The lane, the lane. Yeah, they yeah. widen the lane. Absolutely, absolutely. He also actually uh, desegregated for a short period of time Kansas. You know, he, he had a little uh, gusto about him, you know. Of course, black athlete in Kansas. 
some people have issues with him dining in their restaurants and stuff like that. So he put his foot down in some places. I can only imagine what Wilt Chamberlain would have been like in the modern period with social media because he seems to have a very dominant personality, like a very larger than life Mm -hmm. uh, presence. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, my favorite story about him is that he blocked someone's shot, and it was all ball, but he still dislocated the guy's shoulder. Oh, my. Because he's that strong, so. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Those things happen. Yeah. But, yeah, the conversations are always good. Uh, we'll see them next time. Uh, so we'll be able to talk to them next time about some topics and uh, get some of their feedback on a live feed. Yeah. And, actually, we can make this one appear live if we just – put it as a premiere absolutely and then they probably won't notice the time on the computer hopefully we'll, all right we'll i don't know we'll see all right man tonight. all right so Take let me uh close this off all right so uh that was dr monica and that is all we're going to talk about for now with the topic of uh, slavery ancient and modern so i'll see you guys around